Hello, welcome to mini lecture three on the New England colonies. I've put as a subtitle Establishing Religious Communities in America. Most of the settlers of early colonial New England were motivated by religion. The individuals who settled in colonial New England were Puritans. The Puritans believed that the Anglican Church, or the Church of England, was far too similar to the Catholic Church in terms of theology, ritual, and ceremony. The name Puritan indicated that the goal of the group was to purify the English Church by removing all vestiges of Catholicism. The royal government of England viewed the Puritans as traitors. It's important to keep in mind that the leader of the Anglican Church was the king. So the Puritans were persecuted. Initially, many Puritans migrated to Scooby Manor in Holland. Holland was very opening of individuals of diverse faith, open to individuals of diverse faiths. However, the Puritans became unhappy with their life in Holland. Many of their children were assimilating into Dutch culture, which was very materialistic and not very religious. So the Puritans sought an area where they could settle in more isolation to create a perfect religious community. In 1620, the Puritans in Holland received permission to establish a colony in Virginia. The royal government of England was happy to have the Puritans move as far away as possible. So a group of Puritans set sail on the Mayflower, but the Mayflower sailed off course and the Puritans landed north of Cape Cod establishing a settlement at Plymouth. Interestingly, they had no official right to establish a, gov a, a settlement there. They had no authorization to settle in the region. The settlers established the Mayflower Compact and selected William Bradford as their governor. Approximately half of the 102 settlers died in the first few months at Plymouth. Local Native Americans helped the colonists by trading with them, and showing them how to cultivate corn and other crops. The Pilgrims of Plymouth and the local natives participated in the first Thanksgiving celebration. The Pilgrims established small family farms and practiced mixed agriculture. The Puritans were not by and large seeking wealth, they weren't looking for gold and silver, they were trying to create a permanent community. In 1629, Puritans secure a charter from King Charles I to establish a colony in New England. In 1630, John Winthrop leads an expedition to Massachusetts with 2,000 settlers. Boston, which is a natural port, became the capital of the colony. By the early 1640s, over 16,000 Puritans had migrated to the colony. Due to clean drinking water and a healthy climate, the life expectancy was quite long for the time period, much longer than in colonial Virginia. The settlers believed that they had a special covenant or contract with God. The settlers referred to their community as a city on a hill, an example to the world. They adopted a system of church governance known as congregationalism. This is a democratic system of church governance where the members of the church elect their own pastor. Both men and women could become members of the church, but only men could vote. To become a member of the church, one had to make a testimony or confession of faith. These testimonies generally follow the same basic format. A person would testify how they had committed sins in their youth and were misguided, and then discuss how they discovered God and were saved. Male members of the church were in charge of electing ministers, disciplining congregants, and reaching decisions regarding theology. All villagers were required to attend religious services. Individuals who didn't attend could be punished by being put in the stocks and humiliated. The village was the center of public life. A meeting house was constructed at the center of town. A village government was formed to establish agricultural practices and other ordinances. The houses of the populace were clustered around the meeting house, and the fields were located on the perimeter of the village. Each family was allotted enough land to support themselves. 
and all persons were required to contribute to the ministry's salary, pay local and colonial taxes, and serve in the militia. In 1631, all adult males who were members of the church were declared to be freemen. Only freemen could vote. The freemen elected a government, a court of assistants, and deputies to represent the interests of each town. The colony did not have a theocratic government. The congregational ministers possessed no formal political authority. In 1648, the Laws and Liberties was established as the first code of law in colonial America. Anne Hutchison is an interesting figure. She migrated to Massachusetts in 1634. She had unorthodox religious beliefs, and she shared her views with many women and developed a group of followers. She claimed to receive divine inspiration, independent of the clergy or the Bible. She claimed that she heard the voice of God speaking to her. And this is something that the Puritans did not embrace, did not believe in. In 1638, Anne Hutchison was convicted of heresy and sedition in Massachusetts. The governor of the colony himself debated her in the courtroom. Hutchison was expelled from the colony at this point, and her followers migrated first to Rhode Island and then to New Hampshire. Rhode Island was a welcoming place for individuals who were unwelcome in other parts of colonial America. Um, many people who were kicked out of other colonies settled in Rhode Island. Um, ultimately, Anne Hutchison would have many children, uh, but most of her children, tragically, and herself, would be killed in a Native American attack. Roger Williams is another interesting person in colonial New England. Roger Williams migrated to Massachusetts in 1631 and became a minister in Salem, Massachusetts. He asserted that the colony had stolen land from the Native Americans from the, the pulpit. He also asserted that the government had no right to punish people for their religious beliefs. In 1636, Williams was expelled from the Massachusetts Bay Colony due to his unorthodox views. He purchased land from the Narragansetts and founded Providence in 1638. In 1644, Williams received a charter from Parliament to establish the colony of Rhode Island. Rhode Island was the only colony with religious freedom. Most immigrants to New England were members of intact nuclear families. The families were very patriarchal, dominated by men. Marriages were not arranged. There was a tradition of courtship. Um, a man, young man would go to the familial home of a young woman and approach her father and ask for permission to court his daughter. To marry, a young man had to acquire enough farmland through inheritance to support a family and or through purchase, and a young woman had to have a dowry, a collection of money to bring into the marriage. Very few adults in New England remained single. It was considered suspicious to be single, especially for men. Um, the family was an economic unit. Work was not separated from the home. People worked in their family units. The life expectancy was higher than anywhere else in the American colonies or Europe. The average life expectancy was in the 70s. Men had a higher life expectancy than women due to the fact that many women died in, at a young age in childbirth. The cool climate reduced the incidence of infectious diseases, and there were good sources of clean drinking water. Women were discriminated against and treated as inferiors under English common law. Women were responsible for domestic labor, including cooking, cleaning, etc. Women were also in charge of dairy production and gardens, and women often raised poultry. Women made and mended clothing. They were more likely to become full members of the church. And women typically had many children in colonial New England. Education was valued in colonial New England and linked to religion. One had to be literate in order to read the Bible. In 1642, the Massachusetts General Court ruled that parents had a positive duty to educate their children. In 1647, the Massachusetts legislature 
ordered towns with 50 or more families to hire a teacher supported by local taxes. Towns of 100 families or more had to open grammar schools. Literacy rates were quite high in New England. Harvard College was founded in 1638, principally to train ministers. Men and women generally lived their entire life in the village in which they were born. Most people married individuals who grew up within 13 miles of themselves. Towns were a collection of families with close kinship ties. There was little to no anonymity in the village. Everyone knew everyone else. And newcomers to a village were often viewed with suspicion. Neither the very wealthy nor the very poor generally migrated to the New England colonies in large numbers. Most migrants were middle class. A provincial gentry did emerge in New England as some settlers accumulated wealth through commerce and trade. Families such as the Winthrops, Dudleys, and Pinchons came to dominate public life. Sumptuary laws were enacted limiting the wearing of fine clothing. The Puritans did not believe in ostentatious displays of wealth. There was greater social mobility in New England than in Europe. Most of the population were small independent farmers. Very few immigrants came to New England as indentured servants. The forms of agriculture practiced in New England did not require huge gangs of dependent laborers. Farmers in New England did not own large plantations, typically, and adolescents in New England often worked in neighbors' homes as servants, especially young women. One aspect of colonial life in colonial New England that we might find strange was, were the public executions. Public executions were commonplace in colonial New England. One could be executed for a number of crimes, including murder, rape, burglary, etc. The executions were highly ritualized and designed to convey a moral lesson to the public. On the day of the execution, the condemned would confess their sins and urge others to lead a virtuous life. Large crowds would gather for the execution. The ministers would preach to the crowd gathered um, to view the execution, and then the condemned would be hung by the neck. The goal of hanging was to break the person's neck and end their life quickly, uh, but this required some skill on the part of the hangman. Sometimes it didn't go as planned. If a person was not dropped far enough, they could slowly strangle to death. If a person was dropped too far, they could be decapitated. The executions were subsequently publicized through pamphlets containing the confession, the execution sermon, etc. The minister would and the, the condemned would typically speak particularly to the children, saying, if you don't obey your parents, eventually you'll commit bad acts and sins, and someday you'll find yourself being executed. Children would watch the executions as well as adults. Puritans believed that individuals could make a compact with the devil or an agreement with Satan. The Puritans very much believed in the presence of Satan in the world. In 1691, several adolescent girls began to behave strangely in Salem, Massachusetts, shouting, crying out, thrashing about. The girls accused several people in the community of being witches and of tormenting them. Um, one of the first of the accused was Tichuba, a slave. In the summer of 1692, those accused of witchcraft were tried in a special court. Nineteen people were convicted and executed. Most of the victims of the witchcraft trials were women. Many were widows without children who were relatively powerless in the community. This concludes the presentation. Thank you.